Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles. Have you patched your installation of World of Tanks to update 9.15? I know I have, which is what made it all the more surprising that I could actually get this replay to work. Uh, this is patch 9.14. It's tier 6 Clan Wars and uh, it works almost perfectly with the 9.15 replay system. Almost perfectly, but not quite, which will become apparent at the end of this particular replay. But for now, let's just concentrate on the action. What's going on here, Jingles? There are only seven tanks and no enemy team. This is actually Tier 6 Clan Wars. And I like the fact that you can actually play Clan Wars at Tier 6 because it's a... Well, it's certainly a different experience from playing random battles, that's for sure. You're going to see things happen in the course of this battle that you don't actually normally see when you're playing random battles. You're going to see things like teamwork, cooperation, and people not being dicks in chat. Ah, oh, well, you may as well just have people not playing World of Tanks at all if you're not going to have people being dicks in chat. Uh, well, yes, I know. But do try to contain your disappointment and just bear with us for the duration of this uh, particular Tier 6 Clan Wars battle. This is Chris W34 in the Cromwell B, a very, very nice Tier 6 premium British medium tank. And since it's a Tier 6 Clan War match, you have the usual range of suspects. Cromwells, T37s as scouts, KV85s and M6s, uh, the occasional Hellcat. It's your fairly standard Tier 6 lineup. A couple of things that are not fairly standard is that in a Clan Wars battle you don't actually see what tanks the enemy team have got until somebody lays eyes on them. So the T-37 is doing what he can to try to get some intel on the strength of the enemy team. And you'll note that everybody else, they're all working together. Now, they're deploying with the Cromwells on the flanks, with the Hellcat overlooking the cap circle, the heavies in the centre, all grouped up in a spot where they can cover the monastery in the centre of the map and the cap circle and command one of the flanks of the battle. They've pretty much abandoned the whole eastern side of the map to the enemy team and they're only leaving the T-37 to keep an eye on what's going on over there once he's finished doing his initial scouting runs in the monastery in the centre and making sure that nobody's trying to approach the cap from either of the two lanes around either side of the monastery. There's certainly nobody coming in this direction, they've got it locked down tight so that only really leaves the north-south road over on the far eastern end of the map. So with their position set they dig in and wait. Now you could argue that by doing this they're handing over the initiative to the enemy team and to a degree that's certainly true but they're in a good position to react to just about anything the enemy team does and they're not going to have to wait too long before they get some signs of life and there it is, enemy Cromwell. Now Chris does not have sixth sense on the commander of this Cromwell B but he's fairly certain that he got spotted and it really doesn't pay to take chances. There was also a KV-85 spotted down the other end of that road earlier on. And while he only saw the Cromwell there, that could just have been the precursor to a push down this end of the flank. So he pulls back and he waits. Nothing happens. And then the Cromwell pops up and he takes a hit from the 90mm gun on the M6. But it's still just the Cromwell. Still no sign of the KV-85 that was spotted down there towards the beginning of the match. At the same time, however, there's still no activity anywhere else on the map from anybody else on the enemy team, other than those initial spots that the T-37 got at the beginning of the match. So it's still impossible to say whether or not that Cromwell is alone down there and all he's doing is probing this end of the map for the rest of his team, or whether or not he's actually sitting down there at the spearhead of a whole bunch of enemy tanks and they're just trying to determine how many of Chris's team are up here and whether or not it's worth making a push. Well, they don't have to wait very long to find out. The Cromwell decides to try his luck on the corner against the M6 again and gets shot by the M6 again. And I think at this point Chris's team have decided that, as far as they're concerned, that Cromwell B is definitely acting alone. So far they haven't seen anything else but that Cromwell B down there since the beginning of the match. Now if they're correct and that Cromwell B is acting alone, they've got two different ways they can approach this. Because if that's a lone Cromwell B on this flank, and there he is again, and he takes another hit, he's now a one-shot kill for anybody. And his actions are consistent with an enemy tank who's alone with no backup. Now that he's a one-shot kill, he turns around and he's last spotted heading straight back towards the enemy base. Which would mean that the rest of the enemy tanks are approaching from the eastern end of the map. And you can see the T-37 is taking steps 
to spot them if that is in fact the case. Now, if that is what's going on, Chris's team need to either dig in in order to counterattack the enemy assault, which they're expecting to come from the east, or pursue this Cromwell and chase him into the enemy base and win by capping. And that's what they decide to do, and that's when they run into most of the rest of the enemy team, who were in fact down there. The Cromwell B was not acting independently. Now, however, they're kind of committed, and it's a fair fight. Two tier 6 heavies. In fact, it's not a fair fight. It was, and then an extra enemy tank showed up, so now they need to push the odds in their favour here, and everybody charges forward and gets stuck in. And check out Chris's shooting here. Multiple occasions narrowly misses hitting a friendly tank, and yet precise firing. I mean, this is close. <laughs> but some very, very good shooting from Chris there. Accurate, effective shots into enemy tanks, narrowly missing, hitting allies on the way in. But they've done it, they carried the fight of the enemy, they threw the weight of the team where it was needed, and they're taking out all three of those enemy heavy tanks without the loss of a single tank of their own. Chris, meanwhile, is in hot pursuit of that. Cromwell does not want to let him get away in 124 health, and that's when he runs right into the Hellcat and takes a hit. He's obviously not going to stop. Switches to try to get a long range shot off on the Cromwell, has to slow down to turn, otherwise he's going to crest the rise right in front of the Hellcat. The Hellcat hits him anyway. And now the Hellcat is in hot pursuit, and the Hellcat is a fast vehicle. But what the Hellcat has failed to take into consideration is that Chris is setting him up for shots by the rest of his team, who just finished killing off that KB-85 and are now on the ridge. And that Hellcat is going to get himself obliterated. Sitting duck in the middle of the open there, not even the KB-85 could miss him, and he's done. However, they have now just lost two tanks. The T-37 was killed by the other two Cromwells who were rushing the cap circle. And they've now been joined by the Cromwell B that Chris was pursuing. They've also lost the other Cromwell on Chris's team as he went into the cap circle to back up the T-37 while being given overwatch supporting fire by the Hellcat on the ridge overlooking the cap circle. But with the death of the friendly Cromwell, the Hellcat lost sight of the tanks in the cap, although he did just spot the Cromwell B that Chris was pursuing and he's killed him instantly. But now with no further visibility of the targets, the Hellcat's being forced to go down and get into the cap circle, and that is exactly what Chris is doing as well. Now, because this is a patch 9.14 replay, running under the 9.15 replay system, what you cannot see happening here are the cap counters. What you cannot see is that those two Cromwells in the cap circle are about to win by capping. Chris goes for the auto-aim, the cap's at 100, he kills the first Cromwell, which buys him 5 seconds, kills the second Cromwell, the enemy team capped to 100 with two tanks in the cap circle, and Chris saved the game by killing them both with a fraction of a second to spare. Well done, Chris. Nicely played. And it's nice to see something different from the regular standard battle routine, although that is what we're going to have next, and on the same map, because yesterday was patch 9.15, and that means bye-bye Waffentrager E100, you probably won't be missed too much, and hello Gorilla15. This is Dan 2468T, and Dan has just traded in his Waffentrager E100 for this thing here. And he certainly seems to like it. And there's a lot to like. It doesn't have that ridiculous autoloader that the Waffentrager E100 had, but this 150mm gun, well, it does look ridiculous. It's 63 calibers long. This thing has a 1.5 second aiming time, which is phenomenally quick. And with an accuracy of 0.27, it's more accurate than the Jag Tiger, it's more accurate than the E50M, hell, it's more accurate than the AT-15 and the Tortoise. And when this thing hits something with its 150mm armour piercing... Yeah, the victim is not likely to be very happy about it. <laughs> You know, I always found it strange that you got to machines like the Waffentrager E100, which is a massive hulking fortress of a tank destroyer, not known for its great stealth capabilities, and you got to that from machines like the Rheinmetall Borsig and the Waffentrager Panzer IV. It, it always just seemed like the machine, above and beyond the grossly overpowered nature of the machine in itself, it just didn't really fit in that part of the tech tree. You had this entire line of German tank destroyers which emphasised sneakiness and firepower above all else. 
and right at the end of the tech tree you had something that looked like the Big Bertha railway gun on crack and it just really didn't seem to fit. This machine on the other hand, well it fits, it's tiny. Aside from the ludicrously big gun, it's a small machine and it really seems to fit in the tech tree in a way that the Waffentrager E100 just never did. One thing that is going to make you feel right at home in this particular random battle, particularly if you play on the EU server, is the standard of chat. There's a T-54 driver on Chris's team who is basically a massive cockholster, and you're going to see what I'm talking about every time he opens his mouth. For now, however, well, Chris isn't exactly holding this flank alone. Uh, there is a Buffett Traeger Panzer IV at the back of the road behind him, and the T-10 has managed to get himself a little bit stuck down there and doesn't dare pop out and he's just waiting for somebody to come over and kill him. But you'll note, oh, there's that E-75 again. Is he going to get a shot? It'd be nice. Yep, got him. Too late to save the T-10. And you'll note the sneaky position that the M-41 Grand Final has managed to get himself into. In a previously unreachable part of the map, he's spotting all of these guys trying to push up this road, lighting them up as nice big fat juicy targets with Chris's monster gun. But... They're not having any of it, so Chris is going to have to go after them. Normally, popping over here in something as lightly armoured as the Gorilla 15, when there are so many enemy tanks with really, really big guns in such close proximity, would be absolute suicide. However, they're all facing the other way. There's a bunch of heavies on Chris's team that are threatening the base, so he basically has a selection of targets from which to choose, and he plants one right into the back of that M103. He's going for the reload, and that Yag Tiger does not even seem to be aware that he's here until it's far too late. Got the side of the Yag Tiger, partially obscured by the wall, but hell, when you're firing on a piercing with 279mm of penetration, it's not going to care too much about a brick wall between you and the Yag Tiger. The Yag Tiger's just fired, it's got a fast reload, but it's not fast enough. That Yag Tiger does not have a lot of options at this point. The best option would probably be to drive forward and get under the depression of Chris's gun. He certainly can't turn and run away, he's in a Yag Tiger, he's not going to be fast enough. What he instead decides to do is take the hit on the chin, die, do some return damage, and get that one shot into Chris's tank. But Chris has got plenty of health, he can afford to take the hit. And I think Chris was thinking about either finishing off that M103 or taking a shot at the Jaegeru back in the enemy base when suddenly a wild T-54 E1 appears and he's just fast enough to get around the corner before Chris can take a shot at him. So instead, and this is kind of risky, Chris takes a shot at his Waffentrager Panzer IV that just popped up as it looked like he was looking for a shot at the Jagdpanzer E100. And he takes a nasty old hit in return, although he did do substantial damage to the Waffentrager and set him on fire, but what about that T-54 and one? It's unlikely he was just going for a country drive, checking out the scenery. And Chris is not a huge fan of surprise butt sex. He prefers to give rather than receive. So where's that T-54 E1? Surprise! <laughs> it's me! Oh, that was good. I'm quite surprised the T-54 E1 took as long as he did to get around that corner, but, well, anyway, he's dead. Chris isn't. Anyway, four machines left on Chris's team, and five left on the enemy team, including two Tier 10 tank destroyers, a Gorilla 15 and the Jaegeru, and two Tier 9 tank destroyers, the Fosch, and the Waffentrager Panzer IV. And that's when Chris gets spotted by the M103. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. Takes a hit, but his tracks actually eat it. Reverses tries to bring the gun to bear on the M103, who very wisely decides to hide and cower behind a rock because, well, he can't afford to take another hit. M103 has likely reloaded by now, no sense whatsoever in sitting out in the open, waiting for him to come out and just try his luck again. So, what kind of concealment do we have here? It's not particularly good, it's not good at all, he has been spotted, he takes another hit from the M103 and just does not have the return shot. Once again, backs out into cover. Suddenly, he does not have an awful lot of health to spare. But what he does have is a sneaky little M41, who's pumping 90mm shots into the back of that M103. And the M103 is now called between rock and hard place. Fantastic, M41 finished him off. Chris can now cross the open ground here without fear of being spotted. The enemy team are now down to three tank destroyers. They've lost their last remaining actual tank, the M103. And one of the tank destroyers has been nailed as well. And, well, they're tank destroyers. Where else are they going to be but camping the base? 
So Chris is able to cover all of this open ground and get into a shooting position without any danger whatsoever of being spotted on the way. While he's getting into that shooting position, both teams are reduced to two tanks. There's just Chris and that M41 down there, and the enemy team have their two tier 10 tank destroyers, the Jagdpanzer E100, the mighty Jaegeru, which has been spotted, and the enemy Gorilla 15, which has not. Now Chris is fine in this spot until he fires his gun. If you have a look at the last reported position of the Gorilla 15 on the map, as soon as Chris fires and gives his position away, if that Gorilla 15 is still there, Chris is going to become visible. But at the same time, well, well you've got a shot like this into the side of a Jaegeru, it would be rude not to take it. Chris starts scrabbling backwards, trying to get out of line of fire. He has been spotted. That's the direction from which the shot would be coming if the Gorilla 15 was there. The shot did not come. So the Gorilla 15 is no longer in that position. Question is, where the hell is he? The Walker Bulldog finishes off the Jagdpanzer E100. So it's just that enemy Gorilla 15. Well, he's not where he was last spotted, that much is clear, because if he was, Chris would be dead by now. Turns out he's an awful lot closer than anticipated. Chris has loaded high explosive. 950 average damage with this stuff. And he's going to need it. Where, oh where, can that enemy tank... Oh shit, he's right there. Boom! Headshot. Doesn't kill him. More surprisingly, the high explosive loaded by the enemy hits his gun, so he only takes splash damage. Chris, auto-aim, 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 and hammer that fire button because you fired before he did. And... <laughs> That'll do. This, by the way, was Chris's very first game in this machine. Ace tanker, high caliber, top gun. He did just a hair under 9,000 damage in that game. I think it's fairly safe to say that Chris likes the Gorilla 15 and he's not going to miss the Waffentrager E100. <laughs> Your opinion may, of course, vary. Anyway, that's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed today's World of Tanks video, and as always, take care. And if you're going to MCM London Comic Con this weekend, I hope to see you on the Friday and the Saturday. And as always, I'll catch you next time.